Hi, so um, we're coming into the session uh, today where we are looking at covering the Learning Outcome 3. And the Learning Outcome 3 actually focuses on uh, understanding the relation between, um, you know, the uh, organizational performance and human resources department uh, performance. So let's do a quick cap in terms of what we've studied so far. Now, um, considering uh, this particular unit, what we've done in the Learning Outcome 1 is basically talked about in detail uh, the functions of HR. And when we looked at the functions of HR, uh, we have also gone into uh, some of the details like how these functions of HR then kind of go into helping uh, in the delivery of the key, um, you know, the responsibilities of human resources department. So yesterday we talked about things like, you know, business services, shared services, and we also talked about, you know, the expert services sometimes the HR department is split into uh, performing. And then when we look at matching this with the culture of the organization we, and the structure, we also see that sometimes different companies have different HR culture or, you know, different kind of, um, um, you know, the structure. And because of that structure, what you, what we get to see is that um, there are times issues are created and these issues could be ongoing issues or contemporary issues. And then the functions, various functions of the HR actually help in actually, uh, you know, resolving some of these issues. And these issues could be issues in terms of performance appraisal, compensation and benefits, rewards management. It could be pay and perks. And it could be in general issues based on the legislation side. And those could be uh, things like uh, discrimination issues, uh, equity issues. Or if we look at issues in terms of, you know, uh, the examples that we've discussed uh, during this course of this unit would be, uh, you know, redundancies. When redundancies happen, um, you know, the HR department is typically faced with the dilemma of, dilemma of uh, taking um, a call on the best resources to keep or retain and then let go of people who do not have the right skill sets to be able to perform the role, uh, the growing role in the organization. So, now, the third learning outcome basically focuses on understanding those issues from an organizational perspective. And how does HR come in and solve those issues? And together, between the two, how they help solve, you know, organizational problems. Why do we need the HR department? You know, one of the questions which would come out by looking at studying the learning outcome three would be that why do we, what, what is the role of HR and why do we need the role of HR within the organization? So this could be a fundamental question. So if I have to ask you, now that we know there are issues which organizations face because of resources, and some of these issues are ongoing issues, and what we also get to see is that sometimes you see the role of management is critical in solving these issues. So that begs us the question in terms of how do we understand what relation is possible between the HR department and the organization, and why do we in general need HR department within the company, business, organization to resolve these issues. So does it make sense? Are you able to correlate uh, in terms of, you know, why do we need HR department or why do we need an HR manager in the organization? Can you think of uh, maybe one or two reasons of in terms of why do we need, uh, you know, um, a HR person within the organization? Uh, basically, um, it is because uh, we need HR in organizations because we need to ensure that the organization is able to achieve its success or its goals through the employees. And if we don't have that, uh, we might not be able to increase the organizational effectiveness and capability. That is, to, uh, to an extent, absolutely correct. So sometimes, if I just add on to what you rightly said, um, and I'll expand that briefly by the fact that sometimes you find that there are certain set of people which are in the best position because of their experience and because of the skills and the knowledge about the subject um, to be able to address or, you know, look at a particular problem. So, you know, if you have a, if I if I take a tangent example, sometimes if you're ill, you've tried all your, uh, you know, general medication that you normally try, but at some stage you give up and you say, okay, I need to go and see a GP or I need to go and see a doctor because this obviously is not going away. So when you look at that, you depend on 
um, your you take a judgment and you basically say that okay, I need to depend on somebody who is a specialist who will come in and you know help me uh, or maybe prescribe the right medicine. So similarly, to a certain extent, when we look at organizational issues, now these issues could be when we talk about in general about human resources. So they could be pay, uh, you know, issues related to legislation, the core functions of HR. Sometimes when these core functions itself create issues, then the person best or the department best to look at solving these issues is the human resources department. Now, the other thing that we also look at is um, in order to understand the, say, for example, uh, what is the linking or the linkage between, you know, HRM organization <laughs> and, you know, the objectives which the organization needs to achieve. Who is the person or who is the department which actually has a common thread across all these three uh, key areas, the organization, the resources, and the goals and objectives. So one department which has a key understanding about uh, all these three and how they come together is human resources department. So here again, the strategic function of HR is called on to understand how um, you know best the people are able to perform because they look at job descriptions. Uh, the job descriptions are created by HR. And the other thing that they look at would be things like if the person in the uh, the person is performing the role or is in that particular role, what is required to facilitate the uh, role, um, you know, the role which the person is required to do. So sometimes it falls upon other resources, resources which could be infrastructural, you know, technological resources. Like if people are in sales, they would need a mobile phone, maybe access to a car or you know a company car, you know, some of the demo uh, collaterals which are required. They, they look at marketing collaterals, which are quite so all this, if it is not facilitated, the person or the person in that particular job role might not be able to perform, even though it is given in the job description. So the coordination amongst various departments for them to function effectively and in one particular direction is actually brought across by human resources uh, department. And that is becoming, that generally becomes their key role in terms of, you know, the link between human resource department and the link between, uh, you know, I would say organizational performance. And this is important to understand because the moment we say, um, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that, and that is described in some sort of a job description, then the HR becomes a clear, uh, you know, like a key player in the creation of this uh, highly productive workforce. Because if the job responsibilities are defined quite well and the resources which are required to accomplish those objectives are made available to employees, uh, which is in terms of it could be you know HR resources like if a good pay package is put forward, a good incentive policy put forward, then there is a lot of motivation uh, and you know loyalty uh, which is within the individual to work for the organization, together with the skill set, knowledge, and experience which the person has, and the resources, physical resources provided by the organization, it helps the employee. To kind of you know achieve the objective set uh, by, uh, by the line manager or you know by the organization, and that linkage can is is a key thing because it is only created by it. So if I work within, is that point clear? Should I explain more, or is that point clear? Yeah. I, yeah. So if I have to look at it and you know kind of just give you a different perspective. I work within a company as an example, and I do an interview, I get selected, I get shortlisted, and I get selected, I get a contract, I join the company, and I get, I'm given a job description. And I start to do the role to the best of my abilities as what has been described in the job description. But at some stage, uh, maybe two months, maybe a month down the line, or two months down the line, my line manager or DHR would do a bit of a review because I'm still on probation. And they would then pick out the gap areas that, okay, you are not doing this thing correctly or that thing correctly. And as a feedback to the manager or to HR, the person might say, okay, I joined the organization. I was not given training. I was not given uh, enablement on this or these things were not explained to me. And that is where the gap is picked up by the HR and some training and development is put. Now, when HR functions quite well, wherein they introduce everything like an employee handbook, do's and don'ts, some bit of training, induction, and that is done for the person 
working in that role and also all the enablements are provided that person feels quite confident motivated and also you know quite uh, enthusiastic to take into uh, the responsibilities given that role and because everything required to perform is being provided by hr and the company the hr becomes a key enabler in understanding that okay if these things are not provided as uh, resources or you know embodiments for the person to be able to perform there is no way that even the best experienced person with the best skill set will be able to do because those basic necessities required for you to look at say for example a laptop or a, or a mobile phone or for traveling or you know marketing collateral or have not been provided and that's the reason why the person is not able to then you know perform in their role so here what we are looking at is understanding how hr becomes a common thread across understanding from the time the person joins the organization till the time his appraisal or reviews happen and what are the things which are required to enable the person or the staff to kind of perform you know at the utmost to be able to achieve the uh, you know what we call the uh, objectives of the organization now the other thing if i have to look at one of the key things which hr also provides is uh, you know the environment or the atmosphere in which the person is able to function well so like most companies are required to provide basic things like health and safety a safe working environment uh, you know a good atmosphere when we talk about these things we are basically talking about enablers which allow the employee to kind of function and work well within the organization so all this kind of then falls on to the hr department uh, and then they become kind of a bridge or a conduit between uh, you know what the organization expects and what the organization provides but between them they get the handshake then for this uh, thing to you know basically happen now one other other points which come into uh, you know uh, being just to explain for example the uh, correlation between organization and human resources would be looking at sometimes um, you know the um, resource so i've talked about three points here i've talked about resources i've talked about you know the enablers which hr provides in terms of you know from job description uh, pay compensation benefits and other things and the third thing which i've talked about is that the uh, overall um, you know the um, environment which the organization is able to provide which hr plays a good role in that these three big parameters actually influence the performance of an individual now let's look at another point when we try and look at assessing performance of a uh, you know of an individual or when we say this organization is quite effective because of the fact that they are a small organization lean mean they have less number of employees but they are highly productive that means that the hr or the organization has been able to recruit very high skilled labor or workforce which have you know multi faceted uh, kind of qualities that would to that is to say that you have people within the organization which have various qualities and they are able to multitask and because of the ability to be able to multitask that means the workforce which has been uh, recruited by hr also has uh, you know is basically highly skilled and that highly skilled workforce is able to meet the objectives of the organization quite quickly in the sense that they have the knowledge the skills and also the abilities in terms of infrastructure and other uh, things made available which allow them to be able to you know achieve um, the or uh, organizational objectives uh, you know uh, easily now one of the other things that we also discussed in learning outcome to us that at some stage when you work within the company or a business you you go through a process of evaluation and that process of evaluation is nothing but the process of performance evaluation that means how good you are performing how um, you know well you are meeting the objectives of the organization in terms of the goals and targets set so if you imagine that you work in sales and you've been given a target of say to achieve a million pound turnover in the year then the review which happens every quarter or every 6 months focuses on the fact that how close are you to achieving that goal 
And in order for you to be able to achieve that goal, sometimes you will see the line managers or the HR department will make sure that all the enablers, which are things like um, you know anything which is an enabler, which basically would be required to achieve that objective, is made available by the organization so that you are able to cross the finishing line or achieve that turnover at the end of the year. Now, when we look at evaluating the performance at the end of the year, we spoke about in Learning Outcome 2 of certain techniques through which this evaluation can happen. We looked at in the 1950s, it was management by objective. Then we looked at uh, some of the techniques which takes into account the overall structure of the organization, whether you are getting support from finance, financial side, infrastructure side, you know, other departments, and that kind of an approach basically talked about the balance scorecard approach, wherein you are looked at uh, being evaluated on from all the facets of the organization, but in the same time, they also incorporate things like which are important for you to be able to perform. If these things are not available, the sales team would say that, you know, you've given me a target, that's fine, but there is not a promotion being done or, you know, advertisement being done, which is not creating enough queries for us to, you know, go and go out and close sales. But that means the person is not performing. That means that certain other things which are required by uh, the resource to be able to perform are not being provided. And in that case, that is captured under the balance forecast technique. Now, throwing into this mix, if I look at also um, certain other things which create this correlation and working together would be, we have discussed of uh, things like the culture and the structure. Now, if I look at the culture of the organization, you will see that the culture shapes the structure of the organization. Because if you have uh, the top leadership, which basically works in a particular style, like an autocratic or a democratic style, you will see that that kind of portrays down into the structure of the organization as well. So if you have leaders who believe in working in teams, you will see that the uh, team structure of the organization would be very strong. And uh, in terms of the structure being created because of that culture would mean that the organization works more or less on a flat or, you know, on a matrix scale wherein People are empowered to take decisions. And at every level, you will see managers empower their employees to be able to take decisions within that remit. Now, culture could also, um, and the slide basically here, uh, you know, in, in this part here, it basically talks about what all influences the culture of the organization. And I think in the first session, we had taken the example of Google, wherein we said that a lot of things which a company like Google puts into place is because they see the resources to be the most important resource. Their compensation strategy, uh, you know, kind of looks at meeting, uh, you know, or exceeding the requirements of what the market or the competitors are offering. They are quite strong on their standards and policies. And the environment that they provide for employees within the organization or the offices is by far the talk of the town because when you when you hear of organ best companies to work for, you know, some of these companies like Google, Facebook, they kind of, kind of come, on, come out on top is because the HR influences the fact that if we have um, a simple example here is that in when you work within Google offices, they have the ability wherein you can bring in your children to the office. They have nurse, nurseries and creches. They even have washing machines, showers, and, you know, a lot of other facilities available because they feel if the employees are at ease and they can get these daily course done, then you do not have any loss of productivity because the employees are kind of seamlessly working between personal, professional, uh, uh, you know, arena. And this then allows them to concentrate on the work uh, that is required to be done and they are able to deliver on timelines or the projects are completed on time. So that is nothing but the very congenial environment which some of the organizations provide to their resources so that they effectively are able to function uh, and, you know, the productivity in these organizations is not affected by personal or, uh, you know, uh, personal issues which are, uh, which the organization from an HR perspective also takes takes into account. Now. Having understood that, what we want to be able to do is understand one other thing with regards to uh, this uh, would be that when we look at um, sometimes, um, you know, you get to hear these terms that, you know, this year maybe um, the staff turnover in the organization has been quite high. Or you can hear of terms, things like, um, you know, we've had employees which have, uh, we've lost a lot of days in terms of man days. 
to work on this project. Now, these type of terms or you know um, descriptions you get to hear when when you have employees are they taking a lot of days off off because of being sick or you know for example off because they have personal engagements and because of which what is happening in the organization is that the organization is losing out on the productivity overall because the employees are taking days off uh, from uh, from work to look at other things it could be personal it could be sickness related it could be holidays other things and in those cases what we tend to see is that the measurement in terms of how these, these kind of leaves affect the productivity or the overall turnover of the organization is done by the HR department. And how this calculation is done is that when you look at employment contracts, a lot of organizations would typically have an employment contract, say, let's look at the UK perspective. So when we look at the UK perspective, what you will get to see is that a lot of organizations in the UK normally have about 23 or 28 holidays and all employees get those 23 or 28 holidays. Apart from that, they also then uh, look at certain things like, um, you know, national holidays, have certain other benefits which go across uh, to employees along with the contract. And these could be things like, you know, um, say private dental insurance. It could be things like, uh, you know, uh, family medical insurance in some cases. You get other perks and incentives uh, which basically help you perform better. And these could be pensions, um, you know, which is a bit of a security, keeping in mind that you're working for an organization. Now, what do these things at the end of the day provide from an HR perspective? They provide security to the employee working within the organization. Now, when we look at these days and when we look at uh, these perks which are put together in the contract, what we do get to see is that the HR at the end of the year, when they do a performance appraisal using whatever techniques, management objectives, you know, benchmarking, balance scorecard, what or any sort of other performance appraisal which organizations have, they do. They look at basic things. They look at how many days was the employee off, how many days were taken off as sick leave. They look at how many days were taken off as unpaid days. Now, this helps them directly calculate, uh, you know, the performance of the employee reservist. Uh, what the uh, compensation or the pay package or the benefit is for the uh, for that employee. So assuming you work on 30,000 pounds and you are given 20 days holidays, you have eight national aid holidays, you have a pension plan and you have some of the other perks. Now all this is calculated into some sort of a monetary benefit divided by the 52 weeks that you work and minus the holidays. Now if you've taken additional days off and you've uh, had additional days off as sick, or you know, for other reasons, personal reasons, holidays and stuff, the organization can calculate your productivity in terms of how much your work uh, in terms of costing to the organization on a weekly basis, monthly basis, and you know, on a quarterly or you know, annual basis. Now, once that cost is known, why do the HR department look at that particular cost? They look at that cost because at the end of the day, they also are sanctioned budgets by the top management to work within a cost structure. To say that okay, the overall HR uh, human resources cost in terms of wage bill cannot exceed say 300,000 for a company. I'm just giving an example, or it cannot exceed 3 million for a company. Now, if the wage bill is to go up, the HR then becomes responsible to look at putting measures into place to see where the performance is not happening, and if that performance is leading to a downfall in the organizational performance or the shortfall. And in some cases, you will see. This budget exceeds the overall wage bill because overall the company is achieving higher targets. And if the company is high, achieving higher targets, the pay package of the incentive structure which has been put in place allows them to uh, pay them additional bonuses or additional incentive. But that is seen clearly commensurate to the overall higher achievement or the turnover which the company is achieving because the employees are performing at or higher than 100% in terms of the efficiency. So when they look at issues, these issues at the year end, when the performance appraisals are done and you're performing your role, they then also look at something called succession planning. And succession planning would be looking at if you're due for promotion, if you are due to take higher responsibility within the organization because you're consistently performing for one year, two years, three years, five years. And because you're performing well in that role, they see you as a leader or as a mentor uh, within the organization to take the next step 
to get you to basically promote you. And once the promotion happens, what they are looking at at some stage would be for these employees to then start mentoring some of the others to develop them into functions or other roles which they are vacating and uh, because of which you know uh, you get promotion. So promotional activities, when we look at how promotions uh, happen or succession uh, planning happens, it happens because of the appraisal. It happens because of your performance uh, exceeding the expectation set within the organization. And sometimes succession planning is also done to create uh, contingency plans that if this person is to leave the organization or the business, then we need to have a contingency plan in place and because of which also you will see that succession planning is sometimes put into place. Now, all these things essentially are kind of happening within the HR function of the organization. And sometimes when you look at what are these dimensions within which HR operates, they operate within dim the dimensions of looking at, you know, or the uh, remix of competencies, you know, employees' motivation, and also how much are the employees willing to contribute towards the organizational objective. And that helps define, you know, the overall performance uh, and performance appraisal of the individual when it is done yearly, uh, you know, from an organizational perspective. Is that okay? Is that, is that understood? So what we are looking at is understanding how HR department contributes towards organizational performance and its man management of performance. Those are the key things that we want to uh, look at in, in, in the first part. In the second part, what we want to understand is what is the relationship between uh, you know, the performance and the relationship between, uh, you know, the um, cost of resources. So here, if I if I if I start with an example that sometimes when you look at, um, you know, companies, what they do is they put together a strategy that we need to hire so many employees because we need to look at the long term vision of the organization, or we want to look at the organization achieving this objective. Sometimes you will see that the HR will also be bullish, and they will say, okay, in order to achieve in external or achieve this quality or achieve these many sales, we need so many people in the organization. And what they do is they put together a plan which basically talks about the cost of you know human capital. That means the cost of hiring new people within the organization. And the cost of hiring these new people in the organization is dependent on a lot of things. And sometimes you would see that if this is to be done as a plan, as a strategic plan, what will happen is that they will need to seek approvals from different uh, departments or different, uh, they will need to seek some approvals from different people within the organization. And these approvals typically would come from the senior management. They would say, okay, as you're planning for expansive growth, what we want to be able to look at is we want to put an appropriate plan in place to hire these many people so that they can be hired on time. And when the hiring of these people are, take, uh, are uh, is being done, we do see a budget requirement of this this much in terms of the wage bill or in terms of the hiring cost. And that is where you will see that the HR then looks at making something called the, you know capital human capital cost, uh, you know of the uh, of hiring uh, you know that uh, that many man people or in terms of the manpower. So here is what we look at you know if you can say. Um, uh, you know, model wherein the company would look at managing something called a pipeline of resources, which is basically talking about, you know, um, a number of candidates they want to bring in, but they want to maintain some sort of a pipeline to say, okay, we have so many people which can be brought in if the need be and the organization expands. And this basic framework which they have is something called the human capital strategy framework. That means they are making a long-term strategy to bring in people into the organization, which cannot be an ad hoc process. And at some stage, if they have to build this in, what they have to look at is they have to recruit sometimes new, new people from outside. They have to be ready to recruit new people. So all HR managers will have a list of CVs or you know they will have a list of shortlisted candidates should a need arise, then they do not need to start that process from scratch. But in this case, what they can do is they can dip into the 
shortlisted candidates and ask them or bring them on, you know, for interview and quickly ask them to join, quicken the process or shorten the process of joining. And the third part of that would be strategy would be to retain the key staff, um, you know, within the organization because they are important, very important for the overall success of, you know, the organizational, uh, you know, um, uh, say for example, uh, strategy. So this particular structure that we look at, you know, wherein they try and have a three-phase approach to look at getting new people in, to look at uh, retaining people within the organization, and at some stage, be ready to get more people into the organization would be considered something under something called human capital strategy. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Now, when we look at the human capital strategy, this obviously also is a is a process within you know the uh, hr department and sometimes um, you know when they put the human capital strategy or this kind of a framework in place they look at certain strategic objectives this strategy these strategic objectives would be objectives which are related to you know bringing in people into the company which are uh, which are going to you know kind of work with the culture and the values of the company they will also look at bringing individuals or people into the company which will work within can work individually but can also you know come in and work within a structure or a team within uh, within uh, if required when they are put into a, some sort of a team structure then they will also look at individuals which are going to be fair and not over demanding in terms of the pay and compensation benefits and to a certain extent, sometimes we look at bringing new people in. Sometimes the HR department will also look at bringing new people in because they want to introduce change. And that change could happen because you're hiring somebody from a from a com competitor. And that competitor will be able to bring across certain best practices, which the organization desperately needs to kind of move forward. So you would see that sometimes people are hired from other organizations. Typically, it happens at the senior management level when you have a CEO coming in from a different industry or a sector because they want a bit of, uh, you know, uh, a change in the leadership to be able to reshape the strategy of the organization. So sometimes when they put this in place, the idea is to also look at influencing, you know, the change uh, within the organization. Now, that change would also be related to leadership because if the hiring is happening at the senior most level, you will generally see that uh, you know, sometimes the leaders who join the company or people who join at the senior management level, senior level when it's, it's called the board level or the chief executive level, they have a very definite path of, you know, where, what they want to accomplish, what where they want to take the organization. And that is nothing but, you know, the, uh, the essence of leadership. And that means sometimes when you have to hire people from uh, a different sector or from a different industry and you look at, uh, even you know paying a higher cost in terms of putting some compensation and benefits because you think that is going to be you know beneficial for the company in the long run so that particular aspect that we look at you know contributes to something called the uh, you know human capital strategy and within this we also look at you know something which is called the uh, succession planning and that succession planning can also happen, you know, primarily because if the organization feels that, um, you know, if there are people who can leave and they are critical to the success of the company, then sometimes what they do is, as I mentioned, they would look at some sort of a contingency plan. And these contingency plans would uh, look at training people uh, so that, uh, you know, they are able to have uh, people in, 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 uh, um, in, in, uh, in key positions if the person is to leave, then somebody junior or somebody who is working within the department is able to pretty much, you know, take over and uh, minimize the disruption within the organization. Now, so is this clear? Yes, sir. Very clear. Okay. Now, one uh, one of the other things that I want to bring across when I when I say that you know um, we look at a linkage between, um, say, for example. Uh, you know, HR and where HR's role becomes quite, uh, you know, important uh, is that when we also consider something to do with, um, uh, let's put it this way, <coughs> so something to do with, for example, when we talk about um, you know, how times 
really needs to be done within the organization. You will see that sometimes we get to hear and uh, you know also get to see um, things like that the organization is becoming lopsided. That means you hear these terms that okay, we are too marketing focused or we are too sales focused or we are too uh, you know uh, engineering focused. So sometimes in order to rebalance the structure of the company or the business, you will see that the HR also then plays a very clear role or a distinctive role. And this is primarily done because they want to uh, ensure that there is a balance of uh, functions within the organization, which allows them to, uh, you know, kind of uh, move the company or the uh, business forward. Now, when we look at that, what we are basically trying to say here is that sometimes you will see that in this context, the HR department does the adjustment or they do a bit of a realignment, um, you know, of resources. And this realignment is done to balance uh, you know, um, uh, departments or, you know, balance the business divisions within the um, within the organization. So when we talk about this in general, what we are trying to say here is that sometimes you will see uh, certain strategies being put into place uh, which relate to business uh, objectives or the company's vision and mission. Sometimes you will see that the HR would look at um, putting a strategy in place which is primarily talking about competence. And here is the example of the BT, uh, which, which we have been taking throughout this unit, which talks about they want to you know make 12,000 employees redundant, but at the same time, they will hire 4,000 new employees because they want those employees to have the skill set which are required to work in the company and take the company forward in the next five years. And the third, sometimes you will get to see is that, um, you know, the company will decide to refocus on the existing workforce by upskilling um, the workforce. And this upskilling primarily happens to the root of something called training and development. So what they will say is, okay, we've had so many employees. There are lots of companies which do uh, trainings every year. But in terms of, you know, a full organizational wide capability audit, when the audit is done, they will then look at maybe doing training in every department, every member of the, uh, you know, sales or every member of uh, every departmental team will be trained. And this is being done primarily to look at, you know, ensuring that the capable, the capability of the workforce within the organization is able to deliver on the business strategy, which is there or which is decided by the top management. So when you look at sometimes business is talking about restructuring, if I have to give it a different perspective, when you talk about restructuring of the organization, restructuring of the organization is a key part uh, that is, is a, in that basically restructuring, HR actually plays a key part in that whole process. So where um, the organization feels that we need to restructure, who decides that where the restructure needs to be done, and then where does this process actually start, it again goes back to the very basics of understanding, looking at job descriptions, looking at employee performance, looking at what they have in terms of performing that role. And that is where they start to make calls to say that, okay, this restructuring needs to happen in this department first or in this particular uh, you know, department first because they are doing an audit and that audit is an audit to uh, understand the skill set and the capabilities of the employees working within the organization and basis the audit and the results, they then start looking at a bit of a restructuring to get to a uh, get to a stage wherein they want to uh, again rebalance uh, the employee workforce with the right set of skills to be able to achieve the objective. Another example that I would give you, um, say sometimes you will see that companies have mergers. You will see that a big company or a brand will acquire a smaller brand and the merger, uh, you know, typically between the two organizations happen. When the merger happens between the two organizations, you will evidently see that a lot of companies say that, okay, as a combined entity, they are able to make this much savings. As a combined entity, they will lay off so many employees. The reason why they do this, and when they, when you hear these statements that, okay, the combined operation will lead to loss of 5,000 jobs, as an example. 
So if we look at, uh, say, a merger, some organizations which are being discussed in the last uh, two uh, you know, months, you see that um, Rupert Murdoch's business, which is Fox TV and Fox Television and some of this, is being bid for by Comcast, which is one of the largest cable TV operators in the U.S., and it is also being bid for, uh, bid for by Disney. Now, Disney has a lot of content, but they do not have the infrastructure to deliver this content across, you know, cable networks. So they are interested in buying the company. But what are the effects which we are getting to see where the HR will work? They will work in realigning the business after the merger has happened. So what they will do is you will have employees working within two different, uh, coming from two different uh, types of, you know, organizations. The HR department will, will merge and the HR department will decide on a strategy in terms of what is the business objective of why the merger has happened. And then they will start to relook at all the employees within the organization to look at which workforce and, uh, you know, which of the workforce is fit for the business. And then that, that will help them to look at doing an audit. Once they do the audit, they know clearly this workforce is to be retained, this workforce is to be retained, this department is to be retained, this department is to go because there's a duplication or there is, after the merger, more employees than required to perform in that department. They would then look at doing a realignment. And that realignment will happen on the basis of three things. It will happen on the basis of strategy. That will happen on the basis of competence, which is required going forward as a joint entity because the organization is merged. And the third would be to look at the capability of the employees and then retain those which have the capability to serve the organizational objectives after the merger. So is that okay? Okay. Is that clear? Now, a small business, sometimes a good example of that would be that sometimes you see, um, I'm just taking a recent example of, uh, might not relate uh, with you, but I've seen a few large colleges merging within the UK. I've seen maybe a few large, uh, you know, companies like uh, when you look at uh, one of the biggest car brands here called Jaguar and Land Rover. They were two different companies, but they merged together because they said Jaguar used to make, uh, you know, uh, very good cars. Land Rover used to make very good 4x4 off-road vehicles. But uh, what they did was they merged together and they created a combined entity wherein they said, okay, we do not manufacture 4x4s, but we need that technology. And they said, we do not manufacture cars. I mean, we need the technology of having, uh, you know, 4 by 4 or some of the other uh, things within within their sort of products. So what sometimes you see is the synergy is that companies, when they decide to merge, they decide on the competencies on which they will be merging, what are the uh, com uh, you know competitive edge they will have as a combined entity. And then sometimes it is done primarily to see like Facebook, for example, acquired WhatsApp. Now, why did they acquire WhatsApp? They felt that in order to capture the chat side of market, they were a late entrant. And in order to restart from the scratch, which would take a number of years more investment, R&D and all that, they said, okay, acquiring this company would bring them into uh, the market straight away, but also allow them to absorb some of the technology, technological advantages, which is in the form of code, program code available to integrate into Facebook. And that would help them move the Facebook Messenger forward. So when this kind of a merger happened, what they did not do is they did not take all the 4,000 employees of WhatsApp into Facebook. They only took the most relevant employees, which were uh, which were important for running that structure going forward as a merged entity. So again, these decisions happened on three things: the realignment of the business, or after the merger, the uh, you know realignment of the workforce happened because of three things: one, overall strategy, which skill set, what workforce has, which are required for the company how the persons being retained will be able to create the distinctive competence. And last but not the least, the workforce being retained from an organization which was being taken over, does that workforce have the capability to work in synergy with requirements in Facebook as an organization? And that is where the uh, maybe about 600 engineers were retained and rest of the engineers were let go with some sort of a compensation or a redundancy package. And that is where we will see that sometimes HR, HR's role becomes very important when we consider scenarios like mergers and acquisitions wherein their role is basically looking at finding out the best possible employees which can align with the organizational strategy 
and are having the skill sets to be able to take the organization forward. Okay. Okay. Now that kind of brings us to the you know end of this particular unit. And what we've done is we've looked at um, in a in a in a detailed, very summarized, directive manner. Uh, understood, you know, sometimes we understand HR, take the department for granted, but what does the HR department do? We have understood from the last learning outcome that they play a very key, key role. It's like a glue which combines the organizational strategy uh, with the performance of the organization. It combines the organizational strategy to a certain extent and looks at you know, providing uh, a match with the resources which are required to accomplish that goal in the organization. It also creates a framework which allows human resources or, you know, people as resources to be categorized into a capital framework wherein each person working within the organization has a head cost on his head. That means the head count, uh, if you have 10,000 employees, for example, or you have 10 employees, there's a head count and that head count is equal to a certain amount of money which is going across as a wage bill or going across as a you know cost from the company. If that is not accomplished, then the HR department is you know going to say, okay, you had a lot of staff turnover. That means the recruitment strategies are not being done. Uh, recruitment is not being done properly. And what then in, basically initiates is a bit of a review from the management to say that okay, we do not have sometimes the right HR persons to be able to take this forward. If, an, if you look at an example of an organization like call center, now in call center, you see a lot of staff turnover. That means people join, they work for two, three months, they leave. But that is understood that in such a business environment wherein the work is quite monotonous, that all the agents have to make calls on a daily basis. And sometimes people leave the organization because the work is quite boring, monotonous, or you know repetitive. That is understood that the HR managers have to be proactive to be able to you know look at recruitment as a strategy to keep uh, the you know the operations of the call center going so they always have a plan uh, which is basically a human strategy or a human capital strategy plan which says if okay 10 people are to leave this month they have 10 CVs ready or 10 people ready uh, as a shortlist to be able to join that position but if that same example if we apply to a different organization like production or engineering organization a lot of staff turnover happening then on that side the management would take a note saying that okay there is something wrong that either you are recruiting the you're not recruiting the right set of individuals or the recruitment process is flawed and that is where you know sometimes the human resources department and the strategy is also overall reviewed by the top management in the organization saying that okay you're spending so much cost on recruitment it is costing us this much uh, because those many people are leaving and you're looking at always joining uh, or, you know, looking at always bringing new people in. But that is costing the company a, a lot of money. And that overall, uh, you know, uh, measurement, which the management sometimes does in terms of the review of the HR department is is done from a point of view of financial, uh, you know, capital or resources to say that, OK, how much is this activity in terms of recruitment and selection costing us? Sometimes redundancies and their costs have to be calculated and that gives a very fair benchmark to the senior management to say whether these functions are also being done uh, you know, effectively and are the costs being saved on that side or not. And that is where you know, we need to understand uh, you know, the correlation between organizational performance but also HR management's, HR department's performance within an organization. Okay? Yeah. Now let's briefly, Wellington. In your case, I'm going to discuss the uh, you know assignment brief slightly different, uh, separately and differently. But um, just opening that up, uh, if you give me a second. So, um, you know, I'll uh, probably split this discussion into two parts uh, very briefly. Now, in the case, uh, in your case, Eddie Anchor, basically, when we look at the um, 
you know, the assignment uh, for this particular unit, which is managing and coordinating your resources. So what we're going to be looking at is uh, a few tasks which are required to be done. And uh, they basically concentrate on, you know, uh, the telling outcomes that we've just studied. And in this, you know, your, your scenario that you're going to be looking at, if I look at this, just uh, expand this for you, you're looking at a scenario wherein you work within a uh, multinational garment and textiles company as an HR manager. And over the years, the company has grown and the success has been attributed to effective management of human resources. That means this company has a very well managed HR department. The HR department is doing its job well. They are making sure that the employees are motivated, compensation structure, pay rewards, uh, reviews, all those things are happening on time. And because of which, what we see is that the company is growing year on year in terms of its business. So on the 50th anniversary of this business, you are required to actually, assuming that uh, scenario, you are required to produce some PowerPoint slides, which will basically focus on three sessions. One will be what is the role of human resources in the organization. The second will be talking about goals of effective uh, effective HR management. And the third will be looking at the correlation between organizational performance and human resources. So basically the three LOs that we are covering, one, two, and three, you are required to actually produce three presentations which will cover these three LOs. And within that, you are probably looking at putting together about say, I would say seven to 10 slides, seven to 10 slides and seven to eight slides and cover some of these points. Did you just say seven to ten slides each for each question? For each past, yes. We are looking at in total of about twenty to twenty-five slides. Uh, you know, uh, for this first task, it says fifteen to twenty, but I would say about twenty to twenty-five because uh, you know some of the slides are cover slides or maybe you know it's just explaining the bit, uh, but you are not able to kind of you know do justification because sometimes if you explain some topics like change management, you might have to put two or three slides because you will put up a model like Levin's model of change, three-step change, uh, you know, unfreeze, change and refreeze. But in that, the second slide, you might give an example of how Levin's model is actually used within the organization by an HR manager. Sometimes like a change could be the, the introduction of Windows 10 is happening into the organization. The unfreeze could be the part where in training and development is done, refreeze, the change is basically installation of the software happening, and then the refreeze would be when everybody has the same software and is able to use it to show uh, and work on Windows as a uh, as a company, um, as a platform. So you'll have to maybe put together some uh, slides and tell us they're quite worded. Uh, I think it will be about 20, 25 slides in the task one. But you're briefly explaining the concepts. So responsibilities of human resources, the five responsibilities that we talk about are the responsibilities that you explain in one or two slides. But the second slide would all is we, when you explain theory, the second slide would be showing a bit of application. How does this explain organizational objective? So maybe pick up an example of a company and then show, okay, how do they recruit or, you know, why recruitment is critical for this company. And in this case, that would kind of, you know, meet that criteria. Okay. The second task in your case talks about, you know, with reference to the topics that you've covered, what you have to do is basically do uh, a bit of explanation in the form of a Word document and just detail out the last learning outcome, which is what is the correlation between organizational performance and human resources. So here you have to cover the theory things like, you know, the human capital strategy framework. You're looking at covering, um, you know, some of the key things which are related to, um, you know, performance, which is the techniques that we use to measure performance, like a balance scorecard, you look at management by objectives, benchmarking, and then explain it with an example. Or yeah, I'll show the application in an organization, and that would be basically completing this uh, this second task. So it's an essay or a Word document, and the first part is on PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Okay. So okay. like my case, the one that I have kind of done is basically doing the three LOs. And you're actually doing three, uh, this, you could use this presentation, but what you will have to do in this presentation would be, I am only explaining this here from a theoretical perspective, but some of the examples that I've spoken about, you will need to include that as slides to explain each of that objective. 
Okay. okay. So like the rules of HR is given here, you know, in a, in a way, but what you have to do is explain this in one or two slides in your own words by putting an organization uh, context in mind. Okay. Um, okay. So in, in the case of uh, Wellington, in your case, if I look at just the assignment brief, now, here obviously there are a number of tasks. Um, they're in first task, uh, it's primarily a word, a word document or an essay that you have to do. And you've been given a context as a managing director is not a human resource specialist. So you have to assume that you are the MD of an organization, but you're not a specialist in, uh, you know, human resources is not your specialization. You might be marketing or sales or, you know, accounting, but not an HR specialist. So here you believe that this role may be too large for the business to continue to grow. So in this case, as the MD of the organization, you have to do certain tasks or activities. So these are the three, uh, you know, LOs that we have covered. But the activity would be the first part is, as a managing director, you've been asked to prepare an informative guide to understand the importance of human resource management and its implementation strategies. So here you have to start off with a word document. And in the word document, you are explaining the definition of HS, HSRM, strategic human resources management. The second part would be to explain what is the importance of HRM within HR within organization. So you're talking about the key functions of HR here, uh, which are things like recruitment and selection, legislation, compliance with legislation, training and development. You know, uh, these kind of functions you have to talk about and explain using an example. And maybe this could be your own company that you pick up to explain here. The third part talks about how would you show the framework of HRM. So here you have to look at, you know, the one of the framework models like the Harvard uh, model of uh, SHRM. There are various models which are there. There is hard HRM, soft HRM, but basically what you have to look at is, uh, you have to look at uh, talking about, you know, the various uh, models of HRM. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you this uh, presentation, which basically talks about uh, you know the the different models, of it. and this is what you need to explain uh, you know in your own words. And this some um, this is something which basically shows that how organizations develop a model of HR. Uh, you know whether it's soft, soft means they choose uh, to basically consider people as a biggest asset. So when you look at organizations like Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Apple, they choose and they, you know, kind of treat employees as the biggest asset. In hard HRM, basically the company focuses on tasks. They are not very attuned to employee or, you know, staff requirements. They basically treat them as another, but what they, the task has to be done. So you have to basically define one of the models of HRM, and there are daily models that we could look at. We've studied the three-legged stool model, which which is the old rich model that we covered in learning outcome one. You could cover this or you could cover Harvard framework, which is a very renowned, uh, you know, model of HR uh, from a point of view of, you know, uh, understanding the organizational perspective. So I'll send this to you now. The second part focuses on, you know, your part showing how the SHRM or the uh, HRM process actually works and the role which the HRM is within an organization. So this corresponds to what we spoke about uh, in terms of, you know, last time when we talked about, uh, you know, things, uh, when we detailed the various functions of HR. So this is in activity one. In activity two, you're looking at talking about contemporary issues. Now, what are contemporary issues of HR? Contemporary issues of HR, issues that the HR deals on an ongoing basis, things like discrimination, you introduction of new technology, it could be things like, uh, um, you know, um, say age, compensation, gender, uh, you know, uh, uh, benefits, uh, when, we, when we talk about the pay gender gap between men and women. So these are, com com you know, contemporary issues which you have to cover. Here, you have to do a small presentation, which could be about, you know, five to seven, seven to ten slides, and it has some accompanying slide notes. And just to give you an example of how learners have covered contemporary issues in HR um, in this presentation, um, I'm going to just try and show you maybe a slide which the student has presented. So 
So here, say for example, the student has done the contemporary issues in HR, and the, he, is, he or she has actually talked about a couple of things. Uh, so for example, one of the contemporary issues is you know, how to retain staff. So when you look at this as an issue, you have one staff working on say 10,000, the other staff working on 14,000. Well, the difference in terms of compensation has to be justified because if the two employees come to know, or the employee which is getting lower salary comes to the other employee is getting higher salary, how do you deal with this particular issue? And that is why it is a contemporary issue. Sometimes you will see staff turnover is an issue. A lot of people coming and leaving, joining the organization but leaving. And there are lots of issues, lots of contemporary issues. So this, in this case, the person has only chosen two, which is staff turnover and, you know, obviously compensation and benefits through the point of view of retaining staff. And that could be something that you could get, you know, from a point of view of contemporary issues. The third part basically talks about uh, identification of range of HR strategies which the company could employ and their application within organization. So here you are essentially going to be talking about, you know, different strategies. Which are, what, what is the different strategies? Basically the functions. So how does HR use compensation as a strategy to retain employee within the organization? That could be one that you talk about and that would be covering this, this particular task. You could also look at how recruitment and selection is used by a company as a strategy uh, within the organization. So for example, call center is an example where they have to recruit people again and again uh, for high staff turnover. And that would be a strategy that you could explain. So one function, which is the you know, critical for the organization that you pick, and that has to be explained uh, you know, within that organizational context to cover this particular task. Is that okay? So if you prepare a draft and send send it over, um, you know, what I could then do is give you some sort of a feedback if you're on the right lines, and uh, then you can go ahead and, you know, complete the assignment. Is that okay? Okay, any questions on this so far? Any questions uh, at your end, Eddie Anchor? No, no, I'm good, but I just want to ask you for something. Yes, uh, Um, The lectures I received yesterday, I wasn't really into the class because my son was distracting me. So I'd, uh -huh. I'd really appreciate if you can send me the recording of the class and that of today so I can listen back and, you know, bring out some points for myself. Okay, that's fine. I will, you've got the, did you get the, that, present, the presentation? Is already, I will, presentation is already there with you. I will send you the recording. Okay, okay. The recording now. But today and that of yesterday, please. That's fine, no problem. Are, we send, are, we, are you sending any materials for today? Yes, I'm going to send you some uh, materials for today as well, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. So that's LO2 session recording and I'll send you for the LO3 session recording as well. Okay. This will take a couple of minutes because uh, at the end of the day, what will happen is uh, the recording when I stop. In fact, I could stop it now. And then I <laughs>